big a uh, fight as we could, then I think you fight for you fight the heavyweight champ. Mm. What do you reckon? No, it's not DC. DC. You versus Stepe? Yeah. Those would be the one I'd like to fight. But anyway, we're getting we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, we're getting. Feel like the UFC's gonna hide this man in the back time. Gotta slash UFC president. God, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> 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 the Krillin looking guy is me. I'm the Krillin looking guy. Oh, yeah. 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 Casper and Dennis here for Submission Radio, proudly brought to you by Massage. You're sitting across from the man who takes on Robert Whitaker this weekend at UFC 243, Israel Adesanya, of course, the man behind a lot of the magic at City Kickboxing, Eugene Berriman. And I feel like this is a bit of a tradition that we have with you guys. Obviously, we did it for 234. And we're watching the countdown and you guys last time spoke to us about a bit of a story where Huge, you kind of originally, you weren't impressed by Israel's first fight. You thought about maybe him going to another gym originally. Did you ever think that now with this brand new facility at CKB and moving that not only would he be sticking around, but he'd be there doing some of the heavy lifting and, and helping you relocate to this brand new gym? <laughs> Um, yeah, so after that first fight, I definitely didn't think that, but after he had been at the gym for a while, I knew that he had the potential to be here if he had the attitude, so it was just about finding out whether he had the attitude. So. How much of, of this sort of relocation to this brand new, you know, phenomenal facility do you think was, you know, to Israel's credit sort of brought on by him and, and his rise over the last year and a half or so in the UFC? They had a lot to do with it, but... It had a lot to do with the team as well. I can't put all the credit on him, even though he might want it to be on him. But um, like we always talk about, all the ships rise together as the tide gets higher. So um, all the team, the coaches, managers, everybody behind the team, physios, all the fight team, they all had a big part to play into the where we where we sit today. Mm. Yeah. We were just talking to uh, Eugene Israel. We were like, hey, fainting. Everyone's like... Thanks to Eugene Behrman, fainting is a thing in MMA now. He brought that to it. They're saying city kickboxing, Dana White was talking about it yesterday, yeah. is the reason why he'll be bringing tough down, the contender series down to New Zealand. And Eugene's response, oh, yeah, I guess so. Oh, really? Is that what's going on? Oh, I didn't read that. Oh, am I, are they saying I'm the greatest coach in the sport today? I didn't read. When you, when you, obviously, you know how great he is, but do you think he doesn't sort of voice enough about how much he's done for yes, the sport. But let me, let me just interject there and say fainting has been around since the dawn of the sport. Yeah, I was just about to say that. No, let me say, let me say. No, I, I got We're this. Chill, 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 chill. We're doing it well. It's right. my turn. Relax, relax. I got this. I've done this before. Relax. All right. So, it's nothing new. It's like a jab. It's nothing new. Um, there's certain things that we're doing that's just been around since the, the dawn of fighting, but we're just we're better at it because they they suck at it you know when i went to uh, america to help uh what's his name train for the jones fight anthony johnson uh yeah aj train for the uh no rumble is anthony johnson yeah, yeah. Anthony it johnson, is yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking Joshua on my head. Fuck. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joshua, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out. <laughs> no, so when I, when I went there, um, he kind of sent me over there to like, okay, just see what it's like. And I, I, I text him, I was like, their striking isn't on our level. So these are things that we're just taking advantage of, you know, while they're, they're lacking. And if you watch the fights now, people don't think we notice, but I see everyone hip fainting as well. I see everyone doing little things. And I'm like, hmm, I haven't seen big names as well all the way. And I'm like, well, we're changing the game slowly, but it's not. We're we're not inventing anything. We're just showing you what's been around for a long time. And he just, yeah, he'd rather be at the ABA, which is like a local boxing club in Auckland. He'd rather just be away from all this in the spotlight. But now he's forced to deal with it because I can handle it. Do you guys get a or you do you get a sense that it's almost like CKB versus the world for UFC 243 City Kickboxing? You got Israel in the main event. You got Dan Hooker in the co-main event. That's the top two billing spots. You got Brad Riddell, and you have a lot of other fights this weekend as well. You got Eternal. You got some kickboxing Muay Thai fights. What's is, is this arguably the most important weekend for City Kickboxing? Yeah, arguably, it, yeah, it could be the, the most important weekend. And I don't feel like it's us versus the world quite yet. Um, us versus Australia, maybe, at this point. I think that's the way it's been marketed. And I feel a little bit of that, um, I feel a little bit of that 
tension in a good in a good way. I feel like there's a bit of New Zealand and Australian rivalry there. But in, in what in, in what sense, sense do you feel the tension? You mean on the street, street Robin between Robin and the team? Uh, like, how do you feel like, like the the like the same sort of tension between the Wallabies and the All Blacks building up to a test. Like there's the All Blacks here and there's the Aussies there, and that's that same sort of like uh, rivalry and tension. And it's and a little bit the the all the rugby and all the sports. All our previous sporting history has something to do with it, but I do feel a little bit of New Zealand versus Australia in this um, fight team. Whereas that's not always around, right? That sometimes it's a lot of uh, this individual versus that individual, and you're not necessarily thinking about what countries they came from. But I think there's a little bit of a New Zealand or a lot of a New Zealand versus an Australia thing going on during this fight, which is good. Like it's a healthy rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of. Also, obviously, like Dan Hooker's going to walk out against Alec Quinta, probably get all the cheers from the locals, because we always claim the New Zealanders, Russell Crowe, for example, and then you'll walk out against Robert Whitaker and maybe some people might give you some booze and then some people might cheer. It's really hard to tell. But you, were, but Israel, you were talking about being at UFC 193 and sort of sitting in the bleachers to see that historic Ronda Rousey loss against Holly Holm, feeling the energy in that uh, stadium, Marvel Stadium. What's it feel like to actually be fighting then now I mean, a few years down the track and being the person that draws. I mean, we spoke to Eugene about the fact the win here is this is an organic Australasian card, whereas UFC 193, they had to get Ronda Rousey down there. For some reason, Stefan Struve for Jarrett Rochelle on that card. No one knows why. I had a big rant about it. But how does it feel to be in that position now? Um, it just shows you the growth of the sport in this part of the world. So that was in 2015, if I believe. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, you know, four years down the track and here we are, we're, we're stacking it up with our own home talent. And the next one, probably next year or the one after that, imagine what's gonna be probably like two overseas fighters fighting maybe. And yeah, when I was over, I, I went there um, with Tom, you know, Tom VDK, a friend of mine. Uh, and we just in the bleachers having fun, just enjoying it, soaking it up. And I remember the walkout, because um, there was a guy that walked out to ACDC for those who are about to rock, and it was really long. And I remember just visualizing, because it was such a dope track. Mm -hmm. and I was like, man, I can't wait. Like, I, I visualized it like, this is going to be a mad thing to do. And it's just, now that we're here, I don't know. I, just, I haven't really soaked, soaked it up yet. I'm still waiting till after the fight. That's when I really let it sink in. It's hard for me to let it sink in yet, because I haven't really got the job done. I feel like I still haven't, I haven't done it yet. So... When I get it done, then I'll let it sink in and really marvel in the fact like, damn. And I look back and I'm like, shit, we did all this shit. We did this. Has this been a different lead up for you in terms of like media duties and sort of, you know, everyone's looking at this as such a massive fight. And it is for, the, for this part of the world. And everyone around the world is really excited. You know, if this is your biggest fight, has it felt like it's your biggest fight and bigger maybe than any? Mm -hmm. or Kelvin Gaslam? That's a good question. Has it felt like my biggest fight? I know it's probably the toughest fight I've had to date, but I don't think it's felt like it. And everyone keeps, another question people keep asking me is like, you know, did you do anything different for this camp? Did you train harder? Did you do, I'm like, always train harder. We always put the work in. All we're trying to do is be better fighters, better martial artists. So this camp, we just kept that same energy. I don't think it's been different to anything else. We've just kept the same people around us. We didn't really bring anyone new in. We just, we have the right people around us to, to get the job done. Oh, well, you kind of answered my next question, but I want to touch on it. You said this is the toughest fight. So is it safe to say Rob is your biggest challenge thus far in your career? Because you fought some tough guys. Obviously, Gastelum, that was a really tough war. Um, Anderson Silva, tough for many different reasons. Is it safe to say Rob is the toughest one thus far? Mm, one of, definitely. The Kelvin fight, that's going to be hard to beat. I don't, I don't plan on this fight going like that. I'm ready for five rounds, but if it does, I'm feeling like it's going to be like the Tavares fight. But he's a tough guy. He's, he's a guy that you have to... You have to mind your P's and Q's against, and you just have to break them down. One thing he said to me in the, I think it was at the Kelvin fight, he said, when you're touching him and he doesn't look like he's hurt, you know, don't get discouraged. He's hurt, and eventually, you know, he'll start to break, and that's what happened. So I think Rob's that kind of guy as well, that he, he's going to try and poker face it. But I, I, know, I know what I can do now. I know where we can go. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's yet to be told, you know, see how this fight goes. It's so interesting because everybody speaks about this fight and you sort of analyst, anybody that knows anything about the sport and obviously people outside of your camp, they are having so much trouble predicting what's going to happen in this fight. It's just one of those title fights. It could be one of the most interesting title fights in UFC history in the sense that it organically built itself 
to a peak of two guys who are in their prime, you know, not down the track, fighting each other. And I saw you made some comments that you guys worked on some mistakes or things that you wanted to fix after the Kelvin Gaslam fight, things to do with range, things to do with keeping people away. I'm just wondering, Eugene, what kind of stuff were you guys working on sort of after that Gaslam fight to maximize the range, to maximize the ability for people not to move in and sort of kill that distance like Gaslam did a little bit in that one. And by the way, it's not really something that you can do just like you work on it and it covers all fighters. Every fighter moves differently. Robert Whitaker moves completely different to a Calvin Gaslam who boxes, uses head movement, tries to use a jab to get in there. So is it something that you think will apply to this fight or is it something that applies to all sort of future Israel fights that you guys feel like you corrected? Well, this, well, we, we firstly identified a couple of errors that we made, and then we identified a couple of things that Gaston was doing that we didn't expect and we didn't pick up during the fight, and we were brutally honest about it. That's a mistake, and you know that we, as coaches, we said to Israel, look, we didn't pick that up, and then likewise, he said, look, I didn't pick that up either. So we were brutally honest with each other, and then we addressed uh, those problems, and. You know, we, we have to make the assumption that if we saw what was happening, that Robert's team smart enough to see what was happening. And now we also make the assumption that Robert might use similar strategy and tactics. And then we make an assumption that they're going to do that. And then we make a counter for that. So hopefully they do do that because that's what we're expecting. And then it's just the whole game of chess that we're playing. is like if they, if they think they can garner something from the Calvin Gaston fight, let them try that because that's what we want them to do because we have something ready for that. And that's just the whole, that's the whole sport, that's the whole game, that's the whole, that's everything that happens behind the scenes. Like, it's sometimes not just, uh, you know, him and his opponent going into battle, sometimes there's all that intellectual property going on behind the scenes that can help shape the fight as well. There's a battle going on there as well, so we think we've addressed those problems and we're ready for them to use a similar type of strategy if they choose to, so we're comfortable. Eugene, I'm just wondering from your perspective, but I also want to get your thoughts as well, Israel. I mean, Robert Whitaker, his striking style, some people might look at it and say, okay, this guy has like a great jab. His movement's good. He moves in and out well. He's got a good kick. He's got a hook. And if we sort of address those areas, we could probably beat him. But then it also seems like a lot of opponents thought if we go in there with him and address those areas, once he's there in front of them, he sort of seems to be a lot better than what they think he is. So from your perspective, how good of a striker do you see Robert Whitaker? Do you see him a lot more advanced than a lot of people think he is? A lot, a lot better than ha a guy that has a few strong strikes behind him? He's, he's a, he, it's a strange style he has. Mm. Um, I've always said that some of the, th some of the um, creativity and the weirdness to his style of striking to, to, to us, like are also the same things that make him vulnerable. Those same things that make him dangerous, unfortunately, always make him vulnerable. Like, it's not a style that we would employ or that we would teach at our gym, but it's something that we think we can take advantage of. So at the same time, you're looking at a strange striking style and breaking that down and realizing that there is stuff coming from other angles and there's some, you know, there's some typical things he does that aren't so typical. But at the same time, we're seeing vulnerability in those movements as well that we're going to try and take advantage of. So, um, I, I, like, I, I'm on the fence whether, like, it's, like, the next best, greatest thing, like, you're trying to, like, imply that it is. Like, it's such a great style. It, well, like, it's kind of tricky, right? Because it, you, look, you look at him, for example, throw his jab, and every time he throws his jab, <laughs> his head is in a certain yeah. position. So you go, yeah. all right, like, for example, I think, like, oh, we, we, we might time this. Yeah. But then at the same time, seems like a lot of opponents are having trouble timing and countering to a lot of the stuff that he's doing. Yeah. So it's like yeah. we were watching Nate Diaz UFC 241 and we thought, hey, Anthony Pettis is going <laughs> to beat Nate Diaz. And then we actually yeah. saw him fight live and Anthony was like, this isn't <laughs> what we were drilling yeah. and training think, when he's I think, in here. I think the way you described it is like, to be fair, like it's a tricky style, but mm. any style that is tricky, but at, at the same time leaves you vulnerable is like, you know, like, there's perhaps things that you need to change about that style. So 
that's that's where we're that's where our mindset is. So you know, like there are some dangerous things there, but those same dangerous things that he does, like they leave him also very vulnerable. Israel, I wonder if that Kelvin fight was almost like a blessing in disguise, because a lot of people kind of look at that fight and say, oh, you know, if Kelvin closed the distance, you know, Rob could potentially do that as well. But like you said, you you fix those errors, and I almost wonder if you had fought Rob a little bit earlier maybe those errors would have been there. But because you had that fight, because you had to go through that adversity, it's kind of, you know, leveled you up in a sense and gotten you even more ready for this fight. Is there a sense of that? Mm, uh, I mean, it could have been either Kelvin or Rob. I think when when the going gets tough, as we, as we saw in the last fight, I rose to the occasion and I overpowered him, um, even from the second round onwards towards the end. And... Um, yeah, uh, it was a blessing in disguise because then it let me know where I can go to. Like, there's something I caught him saying somewhere about not... Well, actually, he said it to me and these guys here. Like, you know, he never knew, you know, if if I had that in me. Like, he, oh, he, you have an inkling. And I knew because well, I've done it in training when I'm pushing on the bike and stuff like that. So for him to see that, let him know, like, oh, yeah, he's got that in him. Like, he's a he's, he's born fighter. And, yeah, this fight, I, I, I think... To reiterate what he says, you know, uh, you know, Robert's weird, but so am I. <laughs> you know, I'm very weird. I'm weird with the way I strike as well. So everything that makes him vulnerable and whatnot. Even I watch myself and I see the Kelvin fight, and I'm like, okay, if I was fighting me, what would I do? How would I take me out? Funny enough, Jeff, the cameraman, fucking had you said something that was really smart, and I already thought about it. I was like, yeah, I'd do that to myself if I was fighting me. So I'm aware of these things. I know what stances I'm going to take against Rob, I've already, we've, we've, we've taken care of those things, and yeah, uh, I just can't wait to play. But the other thing that, yeah. that, you know, that you've got to realise is that some of the things Calvin was doing, is, uh, he, he's practised those things over a lifetime, so mm. if... Rob tries to emulate it. If Rob tries to emulate that, we're hoping for that <laughs> to happen, because you cannot, some of the things Calvin was doing yeah. in that fight take a, a lifetime to learn, so if he tries to do it in a few months that he's mm. had, then... Yeah, that will fall I mean, he's into, had a lot of time off. Favor. He's had a lot of time to be training, and he's been wrestling. So I know there's a shot that's coming somewhere. I I know, and I'm, I told I was like, look, shoot on me. That's you know, everyone else has tried. He's been wrestling a lot, and I know you get better with with the work you put in. He's put he's, he's put in some hours. So if he shoots in, my hips don't lie. My my hips are still fast. <laughs> I've got Andre. He's the always Shakira on me. MMA. Definitely yeah. nah, but like. Even when we were training yesterday, I was quite surprised at how good we felt. Dan was surprised at how good he felt. And I'm like, man, it's not just a travel, but we just feel really, really, really good. So, yeah, I'm just waiting for that walk, man. I honestly waiting for that walk to the cage. Uh, you just mentioned that, that when Eugene said to uh, yourself and the camera guy, like, after Gaslam, how he, like, saw something in you, like a true fighter. That you, What did that mean for you when you sort of... First of all, you, do you, know what a guy, you don't seem to me like a guy that sits around giving out lots of compliments. For you to say something like that, that's a pretty massive deal. I don't know how many people you've said that to in, in the lifetime of the fighters that you've coached. So what did it mean for you to hear you say that? And what was it like for you to actually say something like that to Israel? We'll get you to go first. I think we're, we're having a discussion about the documentary we're doing. And he was talking about his first inkling was um, uh, the only ever knockout loss I ever had that I was on the ground, but... I was trying to fight. I was trying to get up. I was still trying. So he's like, okay, this this guy can, you know, he, he can, he can, he's got that spirit in him, the spirit of a fighter. So in that fight, in that fifth round, I, I, I even every time I watch it again, it's not as strong as it used to be, but I still get chills, like, of where I had to go to in my mind when I said that, you're not going to beat me, I'm willing to die. Like, I still get chills about that. And, like, to hear him say that, it was, yeah, it was cool. It was nice to get one compliment. My compliment of the year from him, if you will. Mm. No, I mean, he deserved that recognition from me. Um, the style that I teach is that hopefully you never have to go through that type of adversity where you get tested that much and damaged that much. And, and so often I'll take a fighter through their whole career and they'll never go through that much adversity and damage, so they never feel that feeling and have, never have to go through that test and that's great that's what I want but every now and then I, a fighter the fight doesn't go their way and they get taken to a, a place that we don't really want to go but inevitably we're there and that's when you truly get to see like inside the soul of a person mm. how much of a how, mu how much of a real they're, they're fighters but there's degrees like how how bad and how much they are you know a fighter like a man like you get to look really inside them 
And that was one of those occasions after, after more than a hundred fights and not ever being in that sort of adversity. We, and I never thought we would be in that situation, to be honest, that we got to see kind of like inside his soul and see if he could come out of that hole and rise to that occasion. And he did say so. he deserved that kind of recognition. I think that's why people are so excited for this fight, because they kind of expect that from both of you guys. I think you told us a long time it was the Balmo Liga or something like that, your, your fighting lineage. So it's kind of like both of you guys have that warrior spirit. It's something that's a part of you. Obviously, one of the big narratives and storylines leading into this fight, you, you touched on it huge, the tension, you know, the whole Australian-New Zealand thing. And in some ways, you know, it, it's kind of been downplayed, you know, Rob's a Kiwi, et cetera. But like you, and you admitted that you were throwing jabs at him from, you know, quite a while ago and sort of, you know, saying things to him. Is this fight personal for you in any way? Because I, I feel like from an outside, and the reason why I ask is from an outside perspective, it almost seems like, you know, you've been going after Rob. There is something personal here. But I feel like from your perspective, maybe that's not the case. No, I mean, the first thing I ever said was when he made a meme or someone posted a meme and I was like, huh? First of all, it's a shit meme, <laughs> you know? And people were like, oh, he's so offended. I'm like, no, I'm just making an observation that a guy that's never, ever talked shit, a guy that's never, ever thrown jabs is suddenly making a meme. That's acting out of character. That's all I was saying. People were like, oh my God, he's so hurt. He's so offended. I'm like, sure, take whatever you want from it. And he's even been on record, you know, saying things like, oh, he's not as good as he thinks he is. And all I ever do is rebuttal. People think I start shit. I just say, I'm like, you say something, I'll say it back. So then I said my bit as well. And he's the one, and then I think my dad was the one that pointed out that it wasn't until he went on, on record and said something, what did he say? He said, um, you know, all of Israel's opponents, have, they always downplay his skills. They always downplay, they never, ever, ever give him his due. They just downplay it so they feel better or whatever. And then my dad said in the next interview that he did, because my dad watches everything, mm -hmm. I don't. And my, and my dad said in the next interview he did, then he started to give me props because he's watching what everyone else is saying. So for me, I keep the same story, I keep the same energy, but he's wishy-washy based on what the media or what he's saying or what he gets. So yeah, um, for me, I, I've never, ever started anything with him. It's not personal. You know, I don't dislike the guy, I don't like the guy, I'm, in, I'm indifferent. You know, if I see him after the fight, fist bump, boom, in the hallway, that's it. I don't, I, we're on the same game. We're all trying to get better as fighters. We're all trying to feed our families. We're all trying to create a better future for ourselves. And he's got a family already. He's a family man, so kudos to him. But, you know, I'm trying to get my bread as well. Mm. well you guys are talking about mental warfare there, and I'm just wondering, Huge, what did you think of the comments by um, Alex Prates? Uh, Robert Whitaker's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach, where he said Rob was like a GSP 2.0. Because we were sort of thinking about it, and we're going, is this is this just a sort of a, a ploy to make you guys think that Rob's going to be going for that takedown in that fight? Is it just sort of another sort of step in that chess mental game? Or do you actually believe that they think that this, this guy could be like a second coming of GSP? I don't know you said that, but that's... Uh... I mean, that's high praise. To, anybody to compare themselves with GSP is mm. high praise in terms of like what is tr any mental warfare. Did you even know you said that? You Someone's, nah, that. Dad, my dad said, oh, okay. my dad or David, yeah. My, nah, trust <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah. He watches everything. Well, I need He's, your dad too. Yeah. <laughs> you guys work with us. He knows everything. Everything. I need to update. I need your dad to update me then. But yeah. like, it, that's his, his team. Uh, I mean, their, their responsibility is to Robert and to make sure he feels good and to help Robert out. So um, you take what they say with a grain of salt, the same as us. Like, you, you know, like, what it, it is what it is. I don't really, yeah, he can, yeah, I don't really think too much about it. You're not going to, yeah. Mm, I'm just curious. Well, before we get off Rob, a lot of people sort of talking about middleweight isn't what it was once when Anderson Silva was defending his title. No, Anderson obviously had a great legacy. There was some controversies around it, but also the contenders weren't the contenders that we're seeing now in the division. Do you think at this current point, out of old middleweight champions, Rob has sort of built a case to be maybe the most skilled cha middleweight champion in UFC history? What do you guys think? The most skilled? Mm. Hmm. I think... Is there's more prestige to hold the belt these days oh, compared the to maybe in the past? Yeah, but you can say that across all the divisions. Like, mm. fighting is so much different now. Like, mm. the division of when Anderson was around, if you pop them in the division now, they wouldn't survive. Fight Like, the fighting's past them. They were great for their, where they were at their time. If you pop any one of those guys in this modern era now, they wouldn't. 
survive at all. They'd be at the bottom of the roster. But that's just the the way it is. So like if you if you you can't compare one time to another. Like this mm -hmm. fighting's at different stages in its evolution. So it's not mm -hmm. a fair comparison. But uh, you know, like in saying that, like Robert, he's the champ, and you have to respect that. You know, and we've we've one hundred percent given him that much respect. We went. We there's there's about that. I pleaded with him to get rid of, and you know, to stop even, prance, prancing it, around. With he didn't plead with me that long. I went to Nigeria, yeah. came back, and then eventually I threw it away. Yeah, I haven't seen that. No, because like, no, I didn't throw it away. Like didn't throw it away, he, 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 he was he was worried that I was walking around like you know yeah yeah yeah. But that's that's his job. He's a worry wart, you know. Like he's just like oh. What, you think you're a champ? Yeah, I'm like, well, nah, I just have to, sh you know, like, I have to do the little media tour thing, whatever. And then eventually one day he just rolled to the gym and it was in a box when it was moving day. It was just in a box with everything else. And I think that made him, you know, like, oh, yeah, we're on. And it's the same thing. I haven't touched the belt since. I haven't, oh, I did maybe for like a, a school thing. That was it. But I don't really, I don't see that belt. Like, it's here, but I haven't seen it. I haven't opened it because I'm not, yeah. I'm not attached to it. That put it that way. But the, the mentality is different. Like, mm. we don't, we're not champion yet, so mm. we need the mentality of someone who's trying to be champion, someone who's trying to get what someone else has got. We have to come, you know, we have to come into this country, invade this country, and take what we want, and mm. take it back to New Zealand. That mentality is strong, so we can't be thinking we're champions. So it was, just, you know, like it was a significant thing for us because once he got rid of that belt and it was in an old box at the gym, mm. it meant that we've kind Gathering of switched our. We yeah. switched our mind, and that belt we haven't even looked at. That that belt was, for the most part, lying in a shoe cupboard of mine at yeah. the bottom of the shoe cupboard. Uh, we refused to acknowledge it. Yeah, like even um, so, there was a stare down we did, and it gave me like a prop belt because they wanted me to bring it. I was like, I don't want to fucking wow, lug that thing really? around. And then they gave me a prop belt, and I just threw it on the ground. Oh. I think it was the one in Vegas. I did a stare down, and I just put it on the ground or somewhere, and I was just like, I'm not. Yeah, the mindset's changed, we're so we're on the same page. We're just not acknowledging it. Like, some of these people go out and prance with their intern and bow around like the champion. <laughs> like we're and just people have been referring to you as the champion uh, going into this fight. Like, articles are like, middleweight champion. Yeah. It's very hard to sign We're yet. coming to get yeah. something that off someone else. We're coming mm. and take it by force. Off That's what land. we're trying to do. Yeah. We're trying to come in here, raid, take it by force, and bring it back to our village. You know, here's the crazy thing, right? Last time we did this sit down for 2.34, it was, it was the day before, right? And then come the next morning, obviously we all know what happened. And this is such a massive fight. You know, it's a stadium, maybe, you know, 50, 60,000 people. Is that in the back of your mind? I know your job is not to worry about this kind of stuff, but is there a, is there a part of you that's like, I, I hope I have an opponent come Sunday morning? No, it hasn't crossed my mind. It did early on in the camp, early on in the camp. Um, but this week, it hasn't crossed my mind, so you just put it now, so... Huh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 I apologize. Uh, just try no, 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 because, no. uh, I, I, you know, he's, 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 he's all good. I'm sure he's, he's fit. I'm sure, I'm sure he won't want to pull out again. Even if he has something happen, her ankle, something, they'll find every way to make it to that fight because they don't want to disappoint again. But, yeah, it's not my business. We just, fought, we just worry about us at the end of the day. Is it, uh, I mean, I just have to ask this. Is there a backup fighter here? I mean, we... The media were just having a, a couple of beers last night and we're like, we bet you Paulo Costa, like, um, he, even though he told us UFC 241 when we asked him, he's not the backup fighter. We bet you he's ready just in case anything happens. Is there anything official set in stone because this is a stadium show that there is a backup? Well, we have uh, two guys that manage us, Ash and Tim from Paradigm, and those two will jump in as the opponent like mm -hmm. anytime they want. Mm. Yeah. Tim and Ash at the and same time. Tim, Tim or Ash will jump in as the opponent if Robert pulls out. Yeah. Wow. They can take licks. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, well, you got Dan Hooker against Ally Quinta. It's still yeah, yeah. CKB main event. Yeah. We'll let you go in a moment, guys, because uh, I don't want to be too greedy with your time. But um, you just mentioned Paradigm. That's a recent move from you uh, to sort of move over. As everybody knows, Paradigm also, you know, Conor McGregor, one of the biggest clients. Do you feel like this weekend, in a sense, is a big leap towards the next stage of your career because um, you've always said something and that's fuck the fame but I like the perks I think that's that's kind of your line and I feel like after this weekend it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger is that kind of like in in, in your mind in a sense and is that kind of what you're getting ready for uh, well I've thought about it early on maybe but not like when you get close to the fight a lot of the you kind of th start to zone in on maybe 12 weeks out you, you think about a lot of things and then closer to the fight you start to zone in and focus and then like fight week you just 
you know, you only have one thing in mind. So I don't really think about those things, but definitely afterwards, this this is gonna blow up. This is gonna be the next level of all that fame and want perks and whatnot. So, yeah, I know what's coming with it. Signing with Paradigm, you know, because they've been the guys who've been at the I think the highest end of the spectrum when it comes to the UFC purse and whatnot. So they know what's being left on the table, and you know, this is a stadium show. Yeah, so we we had to make sure we were. Uh, cutting a nice slice of the pie as well when we, when we come in here. Uh, I know you're kind of, uh, you look for symbolism, you're a pretty sentimental guy as well. You got a bit of a thing with numbers, you know, 234, you fought here in Melbourne against Anderson Silva, beat him, 243. I'm wondering if sort of like, th there's anything- You're late, that you're slow. <laughs> I just realized that that's the same- Yeah, as exactly, as yeah. <laughs> no, I, I've already done room, it, I've done it already. I don't give away your room, but yeah. your room is basically four, three, the event four. number. Yeah. yeah, no, it's not 234, but it's 434. Four, four. But like, yeah, um, yeah, I've, yeah, exactly. I've already, trust me, there's, there's left. I think I have probably two- yeah, there's it's not it's not two, but it's four, three, four. It's the same numbers. There's um there's a folder I have on my old phone with like screenshots. It started from way before New York, of just all these numbers, pictures, and stuff that I've just seen that just follow me constantly. <laughs> it's weird. I don't want to get into it. Fuck off. Go away. <laughs> but it's a good thing. It's right? a good thing. Like Symbolism there, like synchronicity. Just call it synchronicity at the end of the day. Synchronicity. We're playing the game, and I said I'm player one. We we're, we're synchronized right now. Everything's flowing as the way it should. I'm just wondering because Dana, we were speaking to Dana White and he's just so high on you and obviously he sees Israel as the future of the company. I mean, he sees you as such a big draw that you're headlining a stadium once you do become champion. And I'm wondering from your perspective as well, Huge, how hard is it going to be sort of managing the UFC's expectations and having Israel out everywhere, sort of representing the company, having some of these title defenses, for example, they flew up Polo Costa and then they put that, you know, deliberately put that in the embedded as well, that I'm coming to Melbourne, blah, 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 to really sort of start. Is he in the embedded? I missed it. It was yeah, for the UFC. 241 embedded. Oh, okay. That he could be yeah. with you oh, and that yeah. was already the same storyline night. before he even fought Yola Romero. They're already planning on getting him down here. It looks like they're already building a fight between you and Costa before you even beat Robert Whitaker. I mean, how hard is it going to be sort of managing their expectations and you going out there fighting constantly, sort of making them as much money as possible? Yeah, I mean, like... A I mean, part of our partnership with Paradigm is that they're the best in the business and that has a lot to do with um, helping manage all of that. And, um, like, our expectations are high. Like, they're just as high as the UFC's. You know, after, you know, when Israel wins this bout, he will, we think he'll, <laughs> yeah, well, we, we think he'll be the the biggest star in the UFC, basically. The biggest star, the biggest active star anyway. I know there's one other star that's sitting out, but... I also know that Israel's goal is to be a bigger star than that guy as well. So you we want just, to be a bigger star than Conor yeah. McGregor? I mean, we're not in the same weight class, but I mean, the numbers, I'm coming for those numbers as well. It's just about, it's just about goals, goals. Mm -hmm. you know, like you're trying to like just go like this. Because this, this, this is probably going to break the attendance gate, you know, I'm sure. And if pay-per-view was still around, probably not because they didn't really uh, help us with this card in that sense with big names. But I'm, numbers, yeah. Yeah, I know, crazy as well, right? It would be cool to have her on as well. But yeah, numbers, I'm coming for those numbers. And I think, I don't, I don't even... Chase them. They just kind of happen just organically. organically. They just chase us. So, yeah, making it happen. Because I was going to ask, how, how do you do that? If, if if your goal is to be bigger than Conor McGregor, sort of, how does that happen? Is that sort of just continue winning fights? Is that just you know something that you're doing? Is it because you have New Zealand and Australasia behind you? How do you do that? Well, it has to happen organically, just the mm -hmm. same way it did for Conor. Like mm -hmm. you just, he keeps just doing what he's what you're doing, right? Yeah, you just keep fight that same. Keep yeah. that same energy, yeah. fight, and also you forget about Nigeria. It's 190 million strong. Wow. You know, 190 million strong, and they ride for their people. So eventually, yeah. when me and Kamaru go back, either not, it probably won't happen in Nigeria, to be honest, because of the, the leadership over there is fucked. I hate it so much. You know, unfortunately, I love my people, but the leadership is fucked when I, I'm being honest about it. But somewhere in Africa, they're going to, maybe even Morocco, they'll have a show over there somewhere. And it's, yeah, I'm telling you, we're coming slowly, but we're coming. I mean, one of the iconic things you guys have spoken about is a stadium show in New Zealand. I mean, for yourself, City Kickboxing, bringing a stadium show to New Zealand. Dana White's already spoken about how he wants to get tough involved in New Zealand and the contender involved in New Zealand, all because of this man over here, but a stadium show. If you guys imagine that show and you can imagine yourself headlining that show, who would be that opponent that would sort of set that fight history for you? 
in that that that's in in the UFC. A lot of people would say like a guy like John Jones versus Israel in a stadium. Yeah, not, not, in not in New Zealand. I don't want that one in New Zealand. I think, why why uh, not? Just out of curiosity. Raider Stadium. I want that one in Las Vegas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Raider Stadium, that one. But that's down the line. Yeah. But, wow, Raider Stadium. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, if it wasn't next year and you wanted it to just be as big well, as you have to build one. They have to build a new stadium, right? Well, if it, if it didn't have to be next year and you just wanted to go as big as, sh- bigger uh, fight as we could, then I think you fight for, you fight the heavyweight champ. Mm. DC? No, Stipe. You versus mm. Stipe? You reckon okay. that could be a good I one thought for about that. I think Moving up to heavyweight. I've done it well, before. He wouldn't move up I've to heavyweight. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. 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 Kickboxing and boxing. I fought Brian Minto in heavyweight. I fought heavyweight tournament. Have you heard about this before? Is this like nah, the first time you're first hearing time, about this? Yeah. Wow, yeah, if huge. You, if you yeah. gave me a choice, you said like, you got to do a super fight. It can super be fight. Like, light heavyweight, yeah. heavyweight. I'm taking heavyweight. Heavyweight. All right. It's just different. Yeah. There's, There's a reason why we did that heavyweight. Different things you can take advantage of, you know, that the heavyweights do that the light heavyweights don't give you. So like... If you wanted to make the show as big as you could. How doable do you think that would be for you, Israel, to jump? I mean, you've done it before, but to jump In boxing and kickboxing. I've stepped up in weight in any, any, any code I've done in fighting. So, yeah, there's a reason why even in kickboxing, when we stepped up in heavyweight, there's, like I said, certain things we can take advantage of. And I never, people think, oh, you have to put on size. Well, that's because they're dumb. They don't understand the game. Mm. So I weighed in with full clothes and a box of Dunkin' Donuts when I last fought at heavyweight. <laughs> You know, so I stayed the same weight, but I still packed the punch, and I even dropped the second guy, flatlined him. If, wow. they're, if they're talking about uh, you having a super fight, then that's, mm. that's then skip light heavyweight, go mm. straight to heavyweight. No one's done that. Mm. And Stipe okay. is, is a guy that you think that could be, if, if he's still the yeah, champion? definitely. What about yeah. if it's like an Nganu guy? Or a DC even. Mm. DC's yeah. not that tall. He's, he's good. Uh, I think he's only got one more fight anyway. DC's got one more fight, and that's a Stipe fight. Let's, yeah, yeah, Stipe, Stipe's... Mm. Steve Hayes would be the like one the way I'd he's like thinking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're getting, we're getting Look at how ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. He's going to hire this man. He's going to be the UFC president for the New Zealand region. This is coming. Yeah. We're getting way outside yeah. the realm of the It's going to be a huge boardroom at the PI session in Las Vegas. Allegedly. Yeah. 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 This yeah. is an interview slash brainstorm yeah. session. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to obviously uh, Rob UFC 243. They're good. Completely. Yeah, I guess we could talk about that. Let's not talk about the state. Show. You'll be thinking. <laughs> we got lost. I've got one more question yep. and then right. I'm done. But yep. you mentioned clothes and it jogged my memory. We've got something for you. I was wondering just, what was under there. Little, it's not a bomb, so you can you can relax. Yeah. No, no, I was like, is that mine? <laughs> Obviously, the story goes, Dennis uh, didn't seem to know how to yeah. pronounce the word anime. Oh. And I'm, Rob pulled him up on it in a pretty brutal way. And yeah. then you were getting a massage. Your physio brought yeah. it up. So then you brought it up and it inspired a bit of a t-shirt. So we'll give you Let's this see. one. There you go. Oh, no. Fuck off. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Look at that. And I- <laughs> <laughs> the Krillin-looking Krillin guy is me. I'm the Krillin-looking guy. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. That's, we who designed own, this? That's how I pronounce it. Some yeah. And I'm... <laughs> I mean, did he pronounce it like that as well? Because you're old. Oh, oh, you're yes. old and you genius. don't understand. Genius. This it makes is, more sense. No, it, it does not. This is <laughs> and I'm... Like, and, and that makes me feel a lot better. One of the best coaches in the world <laughs> thinks it's pronounced the same way. That's and funny. And uh, the, and the, 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 I, I think it's Katagana or Hiragana. The Japanese characters say sexy guests. So a little, little hey. bit. So that's yours to do whatever you want with. You oh, can well, wear oh, no, it. You I'm rocking this. You can wear it. 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 As we let you go, no predictions we've learned mm-hmm. from that one. None none whatsoever. But Never. as far as your legacy goes, you know, you mm-hmm. go in there this Sunday, become the champion. Mm-hmm. What do you what do you think that says about your legacy? And Brett Okamoto of ESPN said this a while ago mm-hmm. and I liked it. I feel like this Sunday w- with a win, you're you're sort of writing arguably the first chapter of your legacy, you know, how you will be seen as a champion, you know, and how that whole reign begins. What do you think this says about mm-hmm. you if you go in there and, and, and win on Sunday? What does it think I say? It says, it says I'm all hype. <laughs> it says what? You're all hype? <laughs> nah, um, Another for me, uh, I don't know. Uh, let me think. Let me think. What does it say about my legacy? For me, uh, my main goal this weekend is just to have fun. And one thing I'm really glad is like we came off the plane and this guy just rolls up to the, the carousel smiling. And I'm just like, why is he smiling? And he's just like, you want to fight, Brad? You want, I'll, if you don't, I'll, I'll, I'm like, what? 
and he pushes me on the carousel. I want to fly. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bradford, you were yeah, no, no, but like, no, no, but like, he was just excited. Normally, yeah. he gets like this on fight day. Mm. And I, like, example, in New York, I, uh, I can tell the story. In New York, I, I was like feeling better than I was now, even like as good as I was now. And I was like, man, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. And then he comes over like two days later and just like, why haven't you been sleeping? Your shit. This and that. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> And then my confidence just went down for like a day and a half. And then eventually after hitting the pads a few more times, I'm like, fuck off. I'm feeling great. So the fact that he came in with the same energy and just feeling great and he's matching our energy, it just makes me feel good. So the main thing this weekend is I just want to have fun. I don't mean, don't get me wrong. When I'm having fun, when we're having fun, we're the best in the world. But fuck the results. I just want to have fun. And that's the main thing. I'm going to walk out there and just express. And then when I get in that cage, same thing. No stress and express and have fun. Mm. I'll tell you what, it's going to be an amazing time. Mm. Sunday, one of the, he doesn't want to take credit for it, but one of the best coaches in the game. He's not going to give himself any credit, so we will. <laughs> Eugene Behrman, City Kickboxing, of course, and Israel Asanya, mm. ahead of a stadium show here in Melbourne Marvel Stadium. It's mm. what dreams are made of. Best True. of luck, and thanks for joining us today, guys. Yes, fun. thank Enjoy you. Thank thanks you for the t shirt. That's yeah. actually pretty cool.